once you become a parent, your life becomes your children. And your happiness is kind of dictated on your, your children's happiness. We are Michael and Melissa Foster, and this is our family. This is our six-year-old daughter, Hattie. And Hattie suffers from a horrible disease called SYNGAP1. My daughter has everything under the sun that you can imagine. 40, 50 seizures a day, uh, so epilepsy, autism, intellectual disability. We really struggle as a family. We don't get much sleep. She has a lot of challenges, a lot of GI issues. I can't wait for the day where I can hang out and take my family and just be able to relax and have a nice meal and not to worry. But that's our life, and it's, it's tough. So Syngap1 is the name of the gene, and it makes the Syngap protein. And we all have Syngap protein in every synapse in our brain. When we say a kid has Syngap, what we're really saying is they have, they have one good copy of a gene and one bad copy. And what we need to do is make that good copy work harder so they get more Syngap in the brain. Doing all the research, of course, as a parent, you're just scouring the internet and just Googling, like, what does this mean? And it was very scary. You know, it's, it's really scary and devastating. And then we came across Syngap Research Fund and I got on the phone to Mike and he was like, I know this is, feels like it's the worst day of your life, but it's really, it, from here on out, it's, it's gonna be so much less isolating. And there's a community of, there's other kids like Hattie. Science is such today that these genetic diseases can actually be treated. And apparently what people do is families create foundations and raise money to make sure that their disease gets addressed. And no one was doing that for Syngap1, so we created the Syngap Research Fund to fund research. To date, we've committed over $2 million to 13 or 14 different grants. So we're funding uh, research on therapies that will increase Syngap expression in the brain. We're funding research on tools you would use in clinical trials. And we're funding research on actually developing these genetic therapies for figuring out which small molecules that are already on the shelf might actually help these kids with Syngap. It's one thing for Hattie to get a real start at life at six or seven or eight, or does she get a start at 13, 14, 15? It's a, that's a big difference. Sometimes it's really hard to see other little girls that are her age doing dance classes and you know other things that little girls like to do, but what's also so wonderful is that we celebrate Hattie for who she is because she's so special and just having sin gap does not define her. She's so many other things. She has such a sunny disposition and she loves her family and animals and she loves being social and she wants to play with her friends and her peers and we want that for her. When I hear these stories, it just redoubles my focus on, yes, we should help this family and we should help that family, but really what we need to do is develop a medicine that can make these kids better. We think there's a cure. We think there's hope, at least therapies for our kids that are, you know, science is, is going to catch up and we're gonna get this fixed for our daughter and for our family. What's so amazing about SRF is that there is no overhead. 100% of donations go directly to science. Seeing the community that the Syngap Research Fund has built and knowing that families are getting support is, it, it's wonderful. If we cure the Syngap one, I've succeeded in life. There are amazing things happening out there. I mean, it's just incredible how fast it's moving. I mean, this is the time. This is the time when we're going to find a cure. I believe there will be a cure someday. Good morning. Welcome to Mission Church. My name is Gordon, and I get the privilege to be the pastor here. 
And I want to welcome you and thank you for coming today to be a part of the premiere of this amazing film, Connection is Everything. And um, I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, are uh, connected to the Harding family. And what an amazing journey and story uh, that we have in store for us to hear and for us to share in. I get the privilege to be the pastor uh, to the Harding family, and I want you to know it has been such a joy to journey with them. Um, I've just come on board in the last three years, and um, in the last three years here at Mission, it has been one of the joys that I have had to, uh, to meet the family, know the family, and get to know Jackson and a journey with them, um, and, uh, and, and to have this place be a part of their family, and to be a part of that story uh, that, that they share um, uh, in their life. And, uh, and I wanted to uh, let you know that uh, if you just arrived, it, just to tell you a couple of things, it, the restrooms are out this door and to the right, so if you need to go anytime, um, the restrooms are there. And, um, and I was going to say one more thing but I can't remember what it is. <laughs> but that's okay. Um, what I want to do now is just take the opportunity to, if you haven't met him yet, or introduce my friend to you. Aaron, would you come and uh, share about today and the things that we have in store? Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Well, I want to thank you all for being here, and there's not a better place that I would have per picked to kind of host this premiere um, than, than Mission Church. And the reason why is because in, two, in 2020, um, when we came to San Diego after being in Japan, uh, we, we started attending Mission Church. And Jerry and Barry, remember, you know, were some of the first people that we met. But um, so I'm very grateful. Uh, and again, Pastor Gordon, thank you. But um, to the church overall, you know, since 2020, you have loved on our family, um, even before we had Jackson and our, our daughters, Natalie and Michaela. But um, I deployed in uh, 07 to 2008. I was gone for a year. Um, and we returned back to North Carolina before we relocated here to, um, to San Diego. And then after a year, I redeployed again. Um, and our journey has been quite up and down, but through that, um, all of you have been supportive of us and what we've done in our journey. And so I'm just so appreciative of um, this community because, again, when I retired, I couldn't think of anywhere else that we as a family would have settled because you can settle anywhere, whether it was Phoenix, back home where we grew up, Monica and I, girls didn't know Phoenix, <clears throat> or I could have stayed in Washington, D.C., and got a government or contract job, which would have been really, really easy. Um, right, Jackson? And, but again, I think when Monica and I talked about our opportunity, it was really San Diego um, and the community, and it was, it was you. Yes? Right? Okay. Um, and in fact, uh, there's a bit of a reunion that's happening here today. Again, we talk about connection. We're a, a community of 1,400 as of... Um, you know, a couple months ago, and many of us are just meeting for the first time. Um, but I want to go back and say uh, the Williams family who are here, uh, we were connected with in North Carolina, and they were a big support to Monica, as was uh, Stephanie and Dan, because those were really hard times when Jackson was first diagnosed. And in fact, Derek and I, uh, in the middle of Afghanistan, because I got I traveled, um, met in southern Afghanistan. <laughs> on one of my travels, which was pretty cool. So if you want to talk about connections globally, I mean, this is really happening. Um, and the film, I just, you know, in the audience, I have the staff from Options for All. Uh, for all. all right, Jackson? Yeah. And, and when we chose to do this film, um, I was introduced to them, and I, I couldn't think of a better organization. Um, you'll, you'll hear more about them, but they, they employ adults uh, into a program to develop them into media who have, who have uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, and they really give them an opportunity to work in the media industry. And again, I couldn't think of a group, um, an organization that could help tell Jackson's story than, than them. So I'm so appreciative to Options for All and what they do here in the community. And they're here in the front, if you, you, know, if you wanna, uh, Matt and the team, so. 
<clears throat> but the families that are here present today, because I know they're everywhere um, globally, and I appreciate all of you and those who are watching in the live stream. But in, in, in the house, um, you know, families that we first met back in 2015, or actually 16 at a conference, Kathleen um, and Connor, we met, and, and that was, we've been so close uh, ever since. Today, uh, here is Julie, um, who's up in Riverside County, and her son, Teddy, were diagnosed three years ago. I'm not sure if Farah's here, but they were recently diagnosed, and, um, and their uh, son, Oliver. Uh, Sandy, the grandmother of Kaya, uh, who's up in Northern California. The Reyes family uh, over here, did I say that right? Reese, sorry, I, I, Monica always corrects me. The Reese family, who, it's crazy, they live a mile from us, right? And, and this is wild, um, but their daughter, Elliot. Um, and then also uh, a family who's been very close to us um, here locally are the Fernandez family and Betsy. And it's a crazy, her story is even crazy because, um, um, yeah, it's, it's a crazy story on how uh, her, Kimberly the, um, saw that there was other, you know, the, there was other things going on in life. And, and we as parents are very sensitive of what's happening in our lives um, of our children. And we know something's not right. And we would always tell you, never, never stop being curious about what's going on with your child. But again, why, why tell this story? Why a story about Jackson? Why about anything about the Harding family? Um, again, we're a, fa we're a community that's less than, where most of our patients are, are less than 10 years of age. They're newly diagnosed at usually three and four um, years of age. And so this is a, a film, a documentary about our journey that helps um, them. And it's not been an easy journey um, always, especially when you're uh, a military family, you, you deploy um, and you leave your spouse behind to take care of three young kids, one with special needs, and then also um, you move every three years. So your continuity of care and your community is always disrupted. Um, again, people enter into your life when you're especially when you have a, a child with who requires so many needs, so many people into your life, whether it's sitting in a therapy room, it's speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy. We speak crazy languages um, that most people don't speak. Uh, the impact on the siblings. Um, life is not always normal for them, especially when they have a sibling who has challenging behaviors and they get in the way. Um, and, and they get in the way and they get hurt. Um, uh, it, it's difficult, right, Jackson? Yeah. And then... We realized just about three years ago, uh, and again, Kaylee, Kaylee, who's here, who's our family therapist, yes, it's okay to have a, th a therapist, um, really has helped us to heal in our family, our daughters, and us to really grapple with um, what it means to have life's challenges um, when there's aggression and all the things that kind of go on. So again, the, the idea of a connection is everything is we've have a community and, and all of you are a part of that and um, we're a part of it together and we, we really appreciate you. And so um, I have one minute um, and I think we're gonna cut to, but again, um, to the families that are out um, in the live stream, we, it's, a, it's crazy how I can jump on a phone call with I met in India and talk about research and things that are happening, or whether it's Danielle in Australia who's doing work with Praxis and they're currently having a conference in Australia called GETA um, that deals with epilepsy and Syngap-1 as a part of that. Um, in Europe, you know, I have Verena and, um, you know, um, Sarah Morris that are so much a part of our, have been part. And, and again, being diagnosed in, again, two, you know, almost 10 years ago, it's crazy to figure out how we're here today. But again, thank you for being here, um, for again, being our community, um, because it, it's, we need you, and, and, we, um, and you've been amazing in our, our life's journey. Um, and, you know, and, and before we cut to the movie, you know, the, the Gralia family, Mike and Ashley, Tony and, and John, 
since April 6th, 2018, you know, we've, we've made a connection that has been, um, we're, we're a tight family, um, and we're so appreciative of them starting the Syngap Research Fund that has allowed us to express ourselves in this way, but represent 1,400 families globally to give our children a chance to a, a treatment that's genetically based, um, that is, is, we're in no other time than we have been before. So again, thank you very much. Um, uh, and uh, again, you're gonna hear, you're gonna hear more about uh, Elemi and her family and what they've done for us in, in that journey. And again, my triathlete family, <laughs> I have a few triathletes here, and somebody from my work, Aaron, again, thank you for being here. Uh, and without further ado, we're gonna cut to the live, uh, to the, the film. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy. Thank you. The Harding family can be anything but dull. They're very energetic, dynamic, active, they're always moving. They are an incredible unit. I spent 28 years in the United States Navy, uh, first as a Navy corpsman, uh, returning to college, uh, where I got my degree in laboratory sciences, and then came back in as a Medical Service Corps officer. Being in a military family is um, a lot of teamwork. It's always a very fun household, everything that we're doing. You know, there's a lot of smiling and laughing and singing that goes on. Jackson shaped me into definitely a more caring person. He's shown me how to have patience and just to be a kinder person overall. I think as a family as well, he's shown us how to work as a team and be resilient. Um, and I think most of all, just have fun. So even when it's freezing cold outside, we'll still take him surfing and whatever brings him joy, um, that brings me joy. He's a boy and like all kids, um, they enjoy that kind of activity. He enjoys being thrown around and being wrestled with, but just laughing and enjoying it and wanting to go back in for more. Jackson was very well loved and cared for by the entire family. So um, he was treated like the little prince. You know, he was so good and you know, that, may, that may have been a red flag for us, but we really didn't realize it at the time until I think his nine month well baby check where, you know, he started missing his milestones. We began the diagnosis of his developmental delays and through multiple appointments to specialists, they suspected that his pervasive developmental delays were related to a genetic disorder or mitochondrial insufficiencies, um, but they weren't really sure. So they gave him the diagnosis of PDD NOS, pervasive developmental delays not otherwise specified. When Jackson was about three years of age, he was diagnosed with autism. And then shortly after there, Jackson started presenting with seizures. He began to really clarify and was able to be more specific than uh, a PDD diagnosis. But I think when Jackson was born, he had a very traumatic birth experience. I remember the midwife just getting next to my side and she told me, you know, this is serious. Like, you need to push, like, give it, give it your all. And I was overdue with Jackson, so we knew he was um, a, a big baby. As Jackson was being delivered, the umbilical cord wrapped around his neck multiple times. And they immediately took him over. He didn't pink up right away. He wasn't vocal in any way, like I remembered with our other two children and I saw them working feverishly on him. He was on the table, being stimulated. Time stood still and it was going on for forever. He did start breathing and um, he pinked up. I, I think they continued to work him up. He had a fractured clavicle. We always wondered 
how that's impacted him in his in his life's journey. In 2015, we were referred to a, a new neurologist that specialized in autism, and she began to do some different workups. So we sent off genetic testing, kind of looking at what might be causing his multiple comorbidities. The results came back that he had 10 genetic abnormalities. So we did parental testing, and it came back that we expressed nine of the 10 and the one that was not expressed was the Syngap one. Prior to that, it had been offered to us when he was much younger, but had we done that, Syngap one wouldn't have even come up. I can remember getting that phone call from Aaron in late December that something had come back, and it was Syngap one. And it was a sense of relief, like we finally were able to put our finger on it. So immediately I, I went into action mode and I identified a document called Unique. And I began to read the Unique doc. And there was a paragraph that was written by a Syngap family about a little girl, Autumn. And I took that paragraph and I changed the gender from, you know, she to he and the name to Jackson. And I sent that to Monica. and. And I'm like, hey, here's, here is Jackson. Autumn and, and her mom, Rebecca, are the first really two that I really connected with. And I can remember first talking, our first conversations with another parent whose son was also diagnosed with Syngap-1. And for the first time, I felt that there was a connection. Someone else understood what we were going through. When we relocated back from the East Coast, we were introduced to a developmental pediatrician at the Naval Hospital. And at that point, I didn't really know a whole lot about autism, but the developmental pediatrician saw that he had the PDD NOS diagnosis and encouraged ABA therapy. Our days were still very packed with therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, physical therapy, ABA therapy. Therapy has really encompassed our world with Jackson. We also realized that ABA therapy needed to be completely and fully customized to Jackson. We went through many companies, many BCBAs, and finally found the one that was determined to help Jackson and to help us. As a result of working with Jackson, I've had to change my practice entirely. I've changed my entire approach and I've restructured the way I deliver my service. I've had to shift my perspective from what I was taught in school and in training as a behavior analyst to a perspective that is fundamentally based on the idea that we need to create connection before we treat. ABA really works best when everyone is involved and we achieve consistency in what I, as a provider, I'm teaching Jackson and so that the family can implement. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is for everyone to be involved. ABA therapy has not only been beneficial for Jackson, but for our entire family. We each have to adapt to how we interact with Jackson. We have to be able to assess his environment. We need to be able to read his body language and how he's reacting to the stimuli within his environment to know how we might be able to redirect and influence in order to keep behaviors from maybe escalating or to keep him happy. As Jackson has gotten older, the main seizure that has always been the scariest are the drop attacks. Jackson can look at grades of grass. He can look at bushes. He can look at a pattern on someone's shirt and he will seize. Again, it was really difficult to get medication into Jackson. Um, and so they recommended a uh, vagus nerve stimulator, a VNS. And, and so we went through the consults of, with a surgeon on our implantation of a, a VNS 
uh, that would potentially help control his, uh, his seizures. We then sought a second opinion because we thought how invasive this surgery would be. We wanted to make sure that we had it right. There was uh, a friend of ours that um, spoke to Monica about someone that they knew that was using um, cannabidiol, medical marijuana, to help with, with seizures. After I was introduced to this mom, she introduced me to a larger group of moms who had exhausted their resources as far as anti-epileptic medications, and they were seeing great results with medical marijuana. And so th that made me very curious and immediately uh, started doing uh, a ton of research on, you know, medical marijuana and, uh, and, and seizures. Eventually, as we matured and grew on learning about um, cannabis for, for seizures, we were uh, introduced to uh, a gentleman, Jason David, who, um, who is son who has uh, Dravet syndrome and was one of the first, if not the first, um, to help his son with uh, cannabis to control seizures. And so uh, he became an amazing resource to us, helping us how to use Jaden's juice to help control seizures for Jackson. We had to be transparent with our doctors. If Jackson has a blood test, he's going to have marijuana in his system. But it is now to the point where our doctors have said, guys, this is what works for you. For the first time in many years, we had established complete seizure control by the use of a pharmaceutical, in addition to using Jaden's juice. Behaviors have always been a major part of our life with Jackson. He has always demonstrated a ton of aggressive behaviors, whether they have been self-injurious behaviors, property destruction, or aggression towards others. And for the first time, I was realizing that it wasn't so much that we were doing or what we were not doing, but what truly was happening inside of his body. So I had um, reached out to a friend of mine who has had very challenging situations with their children and a family that we very much can relate with, and they recommended a therapist. Part of what the Harding family has amazingly mastered is the what part of the process. Um, what is indicated? What does the schedule look like? What providers do we need to have in play? Part of the process is the importance of figuring out the what, what is indicated, incredibly important part of the process, but also the how. How are we going to stay connected? How are we going to ride this out as individuals, as a family, and embrace every component of this process? Family therapy specifically addresses the how part of the process which is how do I and how do we as a family ride out this for the long haul? How are we going to manage the ups and downs that are bound to happen in this journey? You know, being at that low point really gave us an opportunity to bring somebody into our lives that really could help us see our family and help give us guidance and direction to how to heal and manage with our challenges The Harding family, they are a well-oiled machine. They are constantly in service to family, constantly in service to community. And even with all of those amazing attributes being said, this is a family that has deeper, vulnerable parts to them. This is a family that grieves. Um, this is a family that still, despite all of the years, um, gets scared, that worries about the future, and that has to prioritize creating time for connection. The best part about working with Jackson is 100% without a doubt him. His love, his um, authenticity, his personality, watching him and his family grow and overcome their challenges, that has been the most rewarding thing about working with Jackson. Since Jackson and I have this special bond, it allows me to help him and just care for him. Advice that I would give SYNGAP siblings 
is not to be afraid of your situation. Um, share it with the people who are around you and all of your friends. I found that a lot of my friends have been really supportive and have only just wanted to learn if that's not a situation that they're familiar with. Again, connecting is everything and we really want to be able to support each other and make the quality of life for our, the children better as well as for the families. Thank you very much, Harding family, options. While the panel gets up on the stage, um, I want to introduce myself and say a few words before I'm, I think my job is to run Q&A. Um, first, I want to thank Mission Church for hosting this beautiful event. Where's the pastor? There you go. Thank you so much. Um, this is a beautiful event, and to the tech team for live streaming and to options for that great movie. Um, my name is Mike Grelia. I'm the founder and CEO of the Syngap Research Fund. My wife, Ashley, and I have an affected son, Tony, who's there playing a video game. Hi, Tony. And um, uh, that's, that's why I'm here. I'm, I'm so tempted to emphasize many things in that movie. I'm, I'm going to resist that temptation and just try to say things that, um, that are... Uh, that haven't been said yet. And before I jump in, I want to acknowledge Michelle, who's here. She's the leader of the KCNH1 community. All these rare diseases have some random letter number name that is just the gene that's broken. And as somebody who's uh, created and led a patient community now for six years, um, I have this incredible community that many of you are part of, which feeds me, but I also have a peer group of other leaders. And when those leaders like Michelle show up to our events, it, it means a lot. Okay, that was the intro to my intro. I want to say four things before I, and, and while I'm saying these things, please, no holds barred, ask all the questions you want. Um, this is family. On a personal level, um, as Aaron mentioned, April 6, 2018, was that right? The very first uh, family we talked to when we were diagnosed was Aaron and Monica. And... Uh, they have become chosen family. Everyone here knows them, everyone here loves them. Had we not met them when we did, I don't know what would have happened. I think Aaron and Monica are like the, if I'm the founder of the Syngap Research Fund with my wife, Aaron and Monica are the, are the godparents of the Syngap Research Fund. And uh, I think Tony's care has been improved and I think my life has been improved and I think SRF exists because of Aaron and Monica. So um, deep thanks to them. And, um, you know, Monica reflected on how she had her first conversation with Rebecca and she felt like she wasn't alone. That's how we felt when we met them. Uh, so, and uh, we, we now come on vacation to San Diego because they're here. This is, this is where we come. Um, and since I'm standing in their church, I, I, I am genetically a, a Catholic Christian, but um, I feel it important to say that as a Christian family, 
You know, it's one thing to say you're Christian and run around and wear a cross. It's something else to live and embody and authentically, truly, deeply at every turn and facing every challenge, really live those Christian values of service, of authenticity, of faith. And um, I think this movie barely touched on the depth of the suffering and the challenge and the hardship that this disease presents a family with. And I think as Christians, grace is a word that is a huge part of our existence. And the grace that this family embodies as they face these challenges is humbling. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. And then um, as a leader of an all-volunteer patient advocacy group that works tirelessly for the 400 patients in the US and the 1,400 patients around the world, I de we depend heavily on the generosity of our donors but also the service of our parents, the people who are exhausted, the people who are feeding a family, the people who are um, taking care of a kid with a rare disease who somehow find the time to work in Salesforce, raise funds, make posters, do all the grunt work of running an organization. And Aaron Harding's um, service, leadership, and inspiration there have been endless, as has Monica's. So with that, um, Thank you for having us again. And my job is Q&A. So, does the panel need any introduction? No, we have Natalie, see, I got the names right. Natalie, Monica, Jackson, Aaron, and Michaela, the family, and in the back we have Elemy, who is, I know this is being live streamed to other Syngap families, one of the best BCBAs on earth, and the therapist, who's the only person I don't actually know really well. Kaylee. Kaylee. So, how are we doing this? Show of hands? Anyone have questions? Any questions in the audience? Yes, Connor. We got Aaron Jackson and Monica and Aaron and, and Monica and me. Yes, and you. <laughs> you. Thank you, Connor. He's one of ours. Hi. Um, I'll hold it for a sec if you don't mind. So. If it isn't too much to remember in this moment while you're under the glare of the lights, um, it seems to me like you had told me during the diagnosis phase that you had had to pay out of pocket for additional genetic testing. Is that, am I remembering that correctly? That actually got you the Syngap diagnosis? No, um, we're, we're, we're lucky that we have um, TRICARE as our medical. Um, and so through that referral, we were able to get our insurance to pay for it. But to your point is, is um, that's not always the case. To get genetic testing to determine um, the cause of a, of a of Syngap, the only way you can diagnose this is through genetic testing. That's it. And it, it, it's not an easy journey to get that. Syngap doesn't, you, it presents itself like we talked about early with developmental delays. But that's not enough to, to trigger getting genetic testing. We, our seizures don't occur until around two to three, four years of age, typically. Again, sometimes that should be enough to warrant genetic testing, but it, but it doesn't always for families. Our, pop, our, our community is half of percent to 1% of all intellectual disability, which puts us about, in the, in the US, I think, about 80,000, and we're only 400 in the US. Um, so we need more genetic testing. Um, our oldest patient, Karen, who we have a, a movie uh, about celebrating Karen, is, is, uh, was diagnosed during COVID, and she's now, I think, 80, um, 80, no, no, no. oh no, she's 68, she's 68 now. Genetic testing is the only way that we can figure out that we have, and we need more genetic testing. We have, we have um, there used, there's programs called Behind the Seizures that offer genetic testing up to, I think, the age eight. Um, we also have other programs called Probably Genetics, where you can put in and it would trigger opportunities to get it. So I think we as a rare disease community have tried to complement sort of the lack of um, use of genetic testing, Julie, to be able to try to help find the causes of intellectual disability, those with intellectual disability and complex, complex diseases, 
uh, disorders with, within. Yeah, I would just say, hit this family with questions about this family. But genetic testing all day long, and if you know a child with epilepsy or autism, at least remind the families it's possible and, and the cost actually comes down a lot. And I think what the, the only point I would add about genetic testing is until you have a Syngap-1 diagnosis, you don't get connected to the Syngap community, right? And before, and, and I think, I don't think, we, I don't, what I wonder if we don't talk about enough is before you get that diagnosis, what do you have? Like I had a child who was autistic, but not that autistic, had seizures, but they weren't that bad. It was a little slow, but wasn't, and like, what is wrong with this child? And then what did I do to make this problem? It is a, it is a special level of, you know. And then um, once you get that diagnosis, you're connected to community, you're given better clinical care, and you know what's going on. So that, that's the, a genetic diagnosis is not a trivia question, right? It is the beginning of a better care and community for your loved one who is ill. But any questions for this amazing family? Come on, hit them hard. They're good at this. I've been going to church with these guys for a couple of decades, so yeah. I, probably dumb for me to have to ask this. But in the film, you show the chart that had, in, what, 10 different indicators, all of which were positive except for the sin gap? Correct. And um, I'm... I'm wondering, so you must have had testing later that resulted in, hey, this is SYNGAP1. Does that, does that single diagnosis of SYNGAP1 encompass all of the other symptoms, all of the other indicators? And that, so instead of saying, I've got nine different disorders that's all wrapped up in SYNGAP or? Yeah, good question. So, um, so, the, so no, they're not all wrapped up in the SYNGAP. They're all individual. So when you get a genetic test done, um, they, you want to really do what's called a trio, which means you want the, the child gets tested, Jackson, and then Monica and I get tested. And we want to determine um, if, the, if a gene is expressed to cause disease, oftentimes it may not. We have mutations in our genes all over the place. Um, they just don't necessarily express themselves. So in there, you saw a report from Monica where she was either detected or non-detected, but she doesn't. Exp she would not necessarily have expressed the clinical features of those, so it's benign. It's not disease-causing. Same thing with me. And so through that, we were able to, for the other ones, rule those out and say that those are not disease-causing because we don't exhibit the, or, uh, yeah, yeah. those symptoms. Therefore, Syngap is the disease-causing um, gene. And, and in fact, um, 99.95% 9, I mean of uh, the um, mutation within Syngap is de novo. It's random. It just happens. It's not, it's not an inherited disease uh, like some other things, like hemophilia and other things. But it is, um, it, it, it's, a, it's a de novo. It's random. Okay, I want to ask a question to Elmi and the Kaylee. Because there's a lot of Syngap families in the room, and there's even more Syngap families watching, right? So, in your, and I think this point was also made in the movie that many of our families get diagnosed when the kid is young. So, Jackson is one of the older Syngapians that I know about, believe it or not. Like, I have hundreds of kids, zero to teens, but I have dozens of kids who are adults. Which sounds weird to say, but it almost makes sense. So the question to Kaylee and, and Elemy is, what would you want the Syngap families to hear? Like you have become sort of experts this close to a Syngap family, but not in the lived day to day. What do you want Syngap families to know as they think about what their the next decade's gonna look like, assuming many of them are single digit kiddos? Great question. Uh, for the kids, I would say for the younger ones particularly, start as early as possible. When the kiddos get older, um, you have other variables come into play like puberty, hormones, all of that. It gets a little harder for even us as providers to figure out how to get in and help. And also it's a long history of what has already been done, all the learning that the kiddos have been doing throughout their life. So the earlier 
the better, get the basics down, get to understand really your child and how to help them and get early, get everyone involved. That's what I would suggest. Yeah, and I think along those lines, um, in my experience of working with a variety of families, um, definitely with the Harding family, the belief that the grief process is linear we're gonna get the diagnosis, we're gonna go through the motions, we're gonna grieve, okay, we've accepted it, we're good, right? And that's not actually the case. Um, expect the grief to come up during milestones, um, various milestones. Um, when you're looking around and friends and family members have children who are starting to talk, starting to date, getting married, graduating, all of this re-triggers that experience of grief. Um, and I think because of the amazing progress that could happen with all of the service providers, right, the speech, the OT, the ABA, um, a lot of families that I've worked with hit the ground running with it. And it's so important to, to be able to close those milestones, uh, gaps. Um, however, um, a lot of times the family therapy can get put on the back burner. Um, and it's not until years later we start to talk about, well, what does this mean for the siblings, right? Um, what we call in therapy the identified patient, okay, the individual who is uh, really the person who's leading the reason why for therapy. Um, they're getting older. They're turning 18. What does this mean for the siblings? Um, what does this mean for our marriage? What does this mean for our family, family culture, family trips, vacations? Is that in the cards for us? All of those questions are really big questions. Um, and through the family therapy process, um, we get to kind of harden the glue of keeping us together and connected throughout that process. So my encouragement would be to uh, hold each other close. Um, it's a long haul. Um, and the closer we are, the more resilient we are. Yeah, those are good answers. And I would just emphasize, I would sort of stitch those together, The hold me close and throw the doors open, no matter how phenomenal a family is. It's, I, have, I have the privilege of talking to hundreds of families. I see it all from my work. And I see the families who just shut the doors and decide they're gonna tough this out. And I see the families who have the blessing of a community like this. And let me tell you, one of them ends pretty well, and one of them gets pretty messy pretty fast. And I encourage any family to, as hard as it is to say, and as hard as it is to talk about, to welcome in a community. And if you're blessed with a community like Mission Church, then you have people to lean on. And if you're not blessed with a community like Mission Church, go find one. Because there's no way for a family to face this disease or a disease like KCNH1 or whatever by yourself, no matter how tough you are. It just doesn't work. I have more questions for the family, but I want to, anyone else in the audience want to hit them with something? I got two, three over here. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to be exposed to these new, new areas. My question has uh, to do with the research. You mentioned there are families in the US and families worldwide. And who's leading the research and what's going to be the focus on the research based on the universe of families that you have in here in the US and also worldwide? Yeah, um, I'll, let, I'll let, Mike and I could go at, at length at this, but I'll, I'll let Mike sort of give you a summary of that. That's a great question. I, I, yeah, I'm gonna keep myself to 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> when we started, we wanted to make a medicine that would change the genetics of our loved one. Six years later, I've realized that that medicine is gonna come in hopefully a few, three, five years. But by then, my loved one in particular will be 15 and the, it's, the body is built, the brain is made. It's, and, and, and so we go from, we gotta change this, which is the gut reaction, to, oh my gosh, clinical care around these kids is terrible because there's only a couple hundred in the whole country. Doctors have no idea. We are educating doctors. I go to doctor's appointments, new doctors step out, come back and re read me something. And I say, did you get that off this website? And they're like, yeah. 
Well, that's my website. I wrote that. It's <laughs> not how this is supposed to go. So clinical care is a train wreck. And it's cl that's not polite. Clinical care is not where it needs to be. And now our job is to improve clinical care and to make better medicines. And for those of us who are privileged to be in, in countries where these genetic therapies would be available, if our children are eligible, we'll give them. But there are hundreds, if not thousands, of kids around the world who won't have access to those. And so at the Syngap Research Fund, we're about five and a half million dollars of, of grant making in. We're doing everything from funding genetic work to working with clinical centers to looking at repurposed drugs, drugs that are on the shelf right now that we just don't know can help our kids. Because the nice thing about those drugs is whether you're in India or Peru or pick a country, you can afford those drugs and we can help your child with Syngap, right? Just because the disease is genetic doesn't mean the therapy has to be genetic. So we're doing as much as we can because, and this hasn't been touched on much, but one of the things every Syngap parent and freaks out about in, right, right as they're going to sleep is, What's gonna to happen to my loved one after I die? No one knows how to take care of Jackson like Monica and Aaron. And Jackson's blessed, he has Michaela and, and Natalie, right? But so many of these families are like, our kids don't grow up. Our kids don't become completely self-sufficient. And so part of this work is, is improving their function as much as possible and then leaving behind a community that can take care of them. Sorry, I went a little off script there. I got handed a question for the siblings one word of advice as a sibling. How do you retain your, question one. Question two, how do you retain your identity? Can you read the first question again? Just one word of advice for other siblings, because we have a few in the room. John, are you listening? <laughs> John. Um, no, I think that uh, my biggest thing has definitely been community, and I, you know, we've talked about that nonstop today, and it's been truly what's gotten us um, just like the support that we've needed growing up, um, you know, and I'm very thankful for it. So definitely lean in your people. Don't be afraid to share what you're going through or, you know, what's going on in life. People are way more understanding than you would think, um, especially just with the severity of our situation. So don't, don't be afraid to lean on your people. How do you retain your identity? Ooh, never mind, you can have it back. <laughs> um, no, uh, I think, <laughs> I'm not good at answering questions. Um, just making sure you have like your own things to do. Like of course you're gonna be a sibling and it can be your entire life, but also having you know, your own interests, your own hobbies. You can also incorporate them like ceramics. We incorporate Jackson through everything and they shape your life and who you are and that's one of the reasons why I'm becoming a nurse. So just making our experiences and turning them into you know, like opportunities. That's a good word for you, Matt. <laughs> I don't know, I guess for that for me that one's a little hard just because I feel like it is just such a big part of me and I think that there's nothing necessarily, you know, wrong with that. Um, Jackson's a huge part of my life and me as a person, how I've been built is a f impacted significantly because of him. Um, so I think, you know, don't run away from it either, like embrace it as part of your personality and then obviously, you know, have your, have your things that keep you sane. You know, my dad does his triathlons, Michaela does her triathlons, my mom gardens, like we have our own things to keep us grounded. Um, but, you know, it, it's part of our personality, up, down, and sideways. Other hands up? There were a couple over here. Uh, is there anything that families can do to create a basic structure at home? And, and how would they start to get any structure and supports that they would need um, if they have a child with skin gap? Basic Monica. structure. Thank you, Damien. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think what was, what's so important is, yes, we have our special needs child, uh, but it is so important that the siblings, our spouses, ourselves, uh, have lives outside of, of this special individual. And, and it's hard to do, 
uh, I'm very guilty of not doing it, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but we need it. We need to detach from um, the stressors. We need to dial our nervous system down because our cortisol is always ramming up, uh, ramp or ramped up rather, and doesn't come down very often. Um, so it's super important that our, our kids or our spouses, they have their own thing. Um, competitive sports, arts and crafts, you know, whatever. Um, but we all need our own identity. And unfortunately, unfortunately, it, we can get wrapped up and um, drained and depleted. So. Other hands? When you are out in public with Jackson, how do you want people to act? Do you want them to engage with Jackson or ignore him? Or what's best for your family? Uh, I do want people to engage. And Mission Church is amazing at uh, welcoming Jackson, whether he wants to sit in the back with his individuals, that's his group. He literally will tell us, go inside. I need my alone time, I need my autonomy. Um, but definitely, high five Jackson, yeah. Good job having a, an inside voice. Uh, but it's, yes, Jackson, Jackson is so aware of his surroundings and Cognitively, he, he, he just has so much to offer. And, um, you know, just treat him like you would another individual. Yeah, I would, uh, before I give the mic to the next person, um, two points on that. One, like all human beings, all souls, our kids want to be seen. So please do not ignore them. And two, I think this is easily missed and worth repeating. Every Singapian understands at least an order of mag at least an order of magnitude more than they can express. One of the first things I say to every caregiver who walks into my house is, "Do not, for a second, speak about my child in front of my child, under the assumption they don't know what you're saying." I think those are two points worth making. Hey, so you're, uh, well, you're part of a fairly conservative community here, a um, little more than others, less than others, and uh, you start introducing cannabinoids into the treatment. Yeah. How does the Christian community <laughs> respond to you? Yeah, that, that, that is a, that's a great question, right? <clears throat> um, right, so we, we, many of us have growing up how marijuana was used, I think, largely from a recreational perspective, and I think that's our paradigm, Cheech and Chong, right? I mean, those are the, the portrayals of, of, of marijuana, right? And I mean, a lot of medications are derived from things that are in nature that are compounded into, um, into something that's controlled, if you will, and, and able to be, go through a whole pharmaceutical um, regulatory oversight and um, so I think we differentiate it from recreational to something that's medical and that it has um, the properties that can actually help in ways beyond just seizures and I think we're um, getting to a point where um, from the federal level we're beginning to um, change that paradigm and that oh. discussion that allows, because it's a, a category one, that would open it up to be studied, more easily studied when it comes to the endocannabinoid system, but how it can be maybe looked at um, as a medicinal versus uh, a recreational. And I think that's where we, we look at it as, uh, and treat it like, I think California and many uh, states is from a medical perspective, not a recreational. And so I do think that there's many other benefits and I've had um, people within this congregation and outside 
that um, have asked about it, um, even for their grandparents or their parents who are older, um, to be able to look at how it can complement the existing um, FDA approved, but how it might complement um, uh, it as a medication um, over uh, a recreational use. Um, and, yeah, and just one line. And then I think we have cannabidiol. There's an Epidiolex. So uh, Epidiolex CBD um, has one pharmaceutical. It's very different than what we use as a whole plant. So there's a lot of discussion around that. Um, and again, Monica can, will tell you about her crazy story um, with medical marijuana. <laughs> what I wanted to say uh, about the cannabis use, uh, the majority of our Syngap patients have um, exhausted all pharmaceutical drugs um, to prevent dangerous seizures. Jackson has the drop seizures. So, um, yeah, he not only, f um, you know, has an absence seizure, but he will drop to the ground. Um, and pharmaceutical drugs, we've gone through so many. The side effects um, are horrible. They, they create, it, they're chemicals. Um, and um, the side effects are, they impact the patient and then turns to the family. Um, and so many of these medications caused intense rage, um, depression, um, also suppresses their appetites, um, and there aren't any side effects with CBD. Um, and it is the only thing that has worked, like I said, in combination with the pharmaceutical. Um, it's, it's a miracle for us and for many other patients who have Syngap. Um, and it's the doctors open, open their minds and eyes and say, yes, go with it. So, but it is a, it, it's kind of a hard topic to talk about. Yeah, I, I, would, I would chime in. I don't want this to be a cannabis sales meeting. <laughs> no. Um, although I will say that I mean, I am relatively average. My wife is very prim and proper. And if you want to chuckle, imagine me saying to my wife in front of our four-year-old son, hey, baby, let's try some cannabis. Aaron said it was a good idea. <laughs> that conversation was funny. But you have to, um, and, and I will also point out, cannabis has THC, which makes you high, and CBD, which is neuroprotective. And we are giving our children something that is very high on CBD, which is neuroprotective. But before we go down the chemistry lesson, I think Monica's point is important. We don't have an optimal solution. There is no medicine for Syngap. We're working on making one. And we are dealing with children who do not sleep, who have rage, who need medicine to fall asleep, who need medicine to poop, who, need, who are still children. They still get sick. They still need to eat. They still need to play. And they have debilitating seizures that can cause serious injuries, if not death. So our choice is what? If you're lucky enough to have insurance and if someone's paying the thousands of dollars to pour these drugs into your children and deal with the side effects, or what? Every Syngap parent is running an experiment every day with a number of chemicals. Sometimes one of those compounds is medicinal marijuana. And that's, honestly, it's one of the least scary ones. Because, but, but we are making a scary choice every day about what we put into our children. That, that's, that's, the, that's the real reality of, of our existence. Yeah. Uh, good morning. Hi, Aaron. Uh, my name is Victor, and we have my wife and I have little Victor. He's gonna be four in June. And our story is kind of similar. He was late for days. He was supposed to be born in June 5th, and he was born in June 9th, and he got stuck. So the doctor had to perform a, an epistomy. And then they rushed him to Santa Barbara Children's Hospital. He was born in Lompoc next to the Air Force Base. And the only issue that, well, is 
into. The only issue is that uh, I think he might have a aphasia that, you know, he's not speaking yet. Uh, the other one is that here they keep telling my wife that he has flags of autism. And I did, like Aaron, I did a deep dive into that and I am, no, he doesn't. I'm not in denial, I'm just, you know. Uh, so we took him to a specialist and she went, no, he doesn't. So we are kind of like uh, confused. We don't know where to go. You know, because his pediatrician is like, no, he doesn't. But the therapist for this, you know, we're getting conflicted information. So we don't know where to turn to. And Aaron told me about the, the website. And my, my question is, uh, I have to write things down. <laughs> uh, I've been looking on you guys' website. Where do I go to get my son tested? Yeah. Because so, in California, on your website, California yeah. doesn't say anything. Um, I, I've mentioned, it, it, again, the diagnostic journey is not always easy. Um, and it's frustrating. Um, we have probably genetics. I, I'll get you the information on the website. Um, that can help you. Um, and again, it, um, I think that's a great starting point. Um, we have funded that project to get it off board that allows families that believe that there might be a genetic cause um, that will allow you to go through a questionnaire and could lead to, to genetic testing based on that profile. So um, let, let's get together and we'll work you through the probably genetics um, program that we've invested into to try to help cases like yours determine, I, you know, autism, 10% of uh, autism is, is genetic based. You know, we're, we continue to search for a cause for autism. It's, I mean, we think we're at what, one in 64. Um, um, one in 32. One in 32 now, right? So it keeps, I mean, so the prevalence of it, it, it continues to grow, but again, only 10% is genetic, but we'll work on that. Um, to figure that, figure yeah. to get an answer for you. And this is not only our disease, this is many rare diseases. I know a family with AECDY5, their daughter, um, it, it took them until she was almost 20 to figure it out. And, um, and what's helped them is caffeine. And it's changed their, their, their whole community's life. So we're in that, we're on this journey. We've talked about Michelle, and, but we're, there's a journey that we all travel from a genetics rare disease perspective that's important. All right, so hey, hey, Tony, 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 <laughs> thank you, love. Mike. I, I, I would just add, yeah, I got a question over here, mm -hmm. yeah. and I got a question over there. I'm sorry, I've been ignoring you for a while. I keep missing you. Um, but, but I want to emphasize this point. My kid is four. I know something's not right. The pediatrician says it's okay. Maybe it was the birth. Like, let's unpack that for a second. When your kid is four, every pediatrician has had... 10,000 parents who are like, my kid's not right. And they're like, calm down, go home. And by definition, four or five people with a very sick kid, and they can't, they can't tell the difference. It's not their fault. They don't see many people with rare diseases, right? But every single one of my parents, every single one of my parents, almost without exception, was told for years, or told for some time by a lot of people with advanced degrees, it's okay kids develop at different rates. But you're a parent, you know, and it's, re I, it's really hard to understate how scary life is before you were diagnosed, right? So I think pushing like Victor is doing and asking for testing and saying, I'm sh something's not right here. And the other point I'll make is one of the many symptoms of Syngap kids, in addition to, you see our logo is green, purple, and, and um, blue. The green is for intellectual disability, the purple is for epilepsy, the blue is for autism. Those are our three big ones. But our kids have many other symptoms, including hypotonia, which is low tone, which is sort of not less limited strength, but it relates to the musculature. And then you hear about these kids who had, didn't come out, couldn't get out of the sack, right? Or, or had or arrived late. Well, maybe that was the problem. Maybe, maybe that was the symptom. Maybe they were, maybe they had a de novo, Genetic mutation, right? Genetic doesn't mean hereditary. Maybe something was wrong with their gene and maybe they weren't strong enough to push their way out. 
And so maybe that complicated birth is not the cause, but just one of countless symptoms, right? Having a kid like this is just so complex and hard. I'm conscious of time, it's 10.05. Five more minutes, two more questions, unless something's burning. And thank you, um, my name is Jose, I live here in San Diego, and it's a privilege to be here with you. Um, one of the things that Mike, I'm sorry, one of the things that Mike uh, was at the beginning stating, and which is very obvious here, is love. Without love, we will not be able to go to the struggles and looking for hope. And working in the industry and clinical research for the last 23 years, really love is what's the most important for us that fuels our passion, our everyday activities, and the darkness times that we have through. But the most important for me uh, and for Aaron's and all of us is definitely meeting the mics, the advocates groups, and that's what we do in congresses and conferences. The first thing we do is go and meet families and patients and things like that to increase the knowledge. What he is doing is really very honorable and basically we need to start in some point. And my question is to Singap uh, Research is what we are doing right now to increase advocate groups or meet with advocate groups within conferences or congresses. Yeah, um, Mike is only one person um, who can't be at every conference. And so we, this is where it goes back, this is an all-volunteer group that we encourage um, families that are geographically located to conferences to try to participate in those. Uh, we have an annual conference that's aligned to the American Epilepsy Society meeting where we have a two-day conference um, prior to the actual epilepsy conferencing kickoff. Uh, this year it'll be in Los Angeles. Um, and so day one is the scientific. So the research that we're funding, uh, we get reports out on that and we bring all the scientists together, but not only in the epilepsy community, but across um, the spectrum of what we're funding. And then also um, we have a, we've added a family day on the second day that brings the families and the scientists together that allows the families to learn and to motivate them and to engage, because we need them to participate in every survey that we give them, um, which is exhaustive. But it's, it's how, yeah, the patient advocacy groups um, motivate their communities. And we have one of the most motivated communities that are out there. Pharma recognizes that. Um, and that interest gets them the interest in Syngap, because Mike and all of the families globally and in the US uh, do all the surveys exhaustively and, and to get the information out that they need to know about the, about Syngap. Um, and as we close, I list, like there's a couple of, just two closing points is um, none, none of this happens without, without money, right? I mean, pharma needs money, uh, researchers need money to, to fund a postdoc. Many of you have graciously donated to the Syngap Research Fund. And I, for that, I thank you. We can't do it without you. Um, and so I, I call you in my posts um, investors because you truly are investing in Jackson. You're truly investing in our community to get us ready for um, clinical trials. Um, and it's, it's a five to 10 year journey, um, if you look at the graphs, to get a drug to market. Um, and we're in a better place. But um, so again, you know, we bring it together to sort of drive towards the grassroots of funding the research that needs to fill the gaps of knowledge in order for us to be ready for a clinical trial. Um, and, and then lastly is the, the picture of Monica and Jackson, which I, I, I chose as the representation of um, connection is everything that you see posted. This was um, just before Jackson turned 18, or he had just turned 18, and we were um, having our conservatorship uh, hearing with the judge. 
uh, in order to get our conservatorship for Jackson. Um, so this was a this is a turning point in our life. This is a a major turning point in our life because Jackson now at 18 is an adult and it transitions, transitions him in from where we've been at in this journey as a pediatric patient into a new um, chapter of, of adulthood for which, as Mike pointed out, um, is, is not always well suited. Um, medically, um, to care for children into adulthood, pediatrics is well set up. Uh, the adult care system is, is not, and that's something we try to influence. Um, we're, we're working on research on SYNCAP and adults um, to educate. And then also, what's, what is um, Jackson's long-term, and we're grateful to be in California with the benefits that we, um, that the, the state provides, um, but it, it is a challenge. So again, when you, when you see this picture of Monica and Jackson, I just ask that you just remember that this is a turning point uh, in not only our lives, but for the families that have young children to be thinking about what am I doing to get ready for this, to this, for this turning point in life from child to adulthood. Um, and, and what we do every day from here on out um, uh, will make a difference. Our children, our, our children will live into, well into their, into their older age. Karen, um, Nancy's sister, has proven that. She's 68. So we, we will have our, our children, and that's a long time. Um, so again, but we can't do it without you, um, Mission, and, and as our community, we can't do it within our respective communities um, for where um, families are. And so we just say, you're not, uh, you know, families, you're not alone. Find a community, connect with, uh, Syngap Research Fund, connect, again, find connections. Don't be afraid to have a family therapist. They're okay, they're, they don't bite. Um, because there are, there are the challenges. And again, as we close, um, I'll let Monica say a word, but uh, we, again, we wanna thank, we wanna thank you, we wanna thank you. I'm good. You know I'm the mom. No, I just, coming in here to Mission Church, um, I really, it's quite an amazing feeling and just to be supported and loved by so many and the fact that we have a place, we have a, we have a church family and a church home um, and it, it truly is an amazing feeling because there are so many families that are not welcome in a community like this and they should be. So thank you for being here and Thank you for supporting us and praying for us and loving on us all the time. Thank you. Would you join me in, in, in thanking Mike, our MC today, and uh, the, the person in, who's helping research to happen. And for Options for All, let's give them a big hand. That was amazing. And scrolling across the name, I saw Zach Watkins' name up there, one of our own kids from our, our uh, church and helping and all that. Thank you, Zach. Um, it was great to see you in there. And let's thank the, uh, the Harding family for their courage to share their lives with all of us today. Thank you. I invite you to stay standing. We're going to close in a word of prayer in just one second. Just in my own heart, Victor, as you were, were, were asking questions, it reminded me that connection is everything, isn't it? I mean, Victor's going through, and, and how do you do it except being connected to people that have gone down the road 
and we can help one another journey together. And that's why I'm so grateful for this church and how you have been a part of that connection. And to all of the people that sit with Jackson on Sunday mornings that love him and care for him, that make space for him, you know what I, I know? That because of Jackson, your lives have been impacted and changed. But you know what? It's the same is true. Jackson's life is impacted and changed because we have been a part of it. And so I'm so grateful for that. And so remember that uh, let's do a good job connecting. Amen? Would you bow your heads with me? And Father in heaven, we are grateful that we have a connection with you. And Lord, you have a connection with us. And because of that, Lord God, our lives are filled with purpose. And the gentleman over here that expressed how important love is. And we began the day talking about grace. And all of that leads to, Lord God, just the beautiful relationships that we enjoy with you and then with one another. Help us to live into the connections and make them more stronger, more beautiful, and more healthy. We pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. Thank you so much for joining us today.